Hey, you're at home at the Wayne. I'm Richard Adams of the Boogie Kings. We do live at the Wayne and we're going to interview the Boogie Kings today. JT in the blue up in the corner is from uh, Salem. He's at his executive suite in Salem. William is in Stanton, Virginia. And I am in Stanton, Virginia also about a half a mile from William as the crow flies. Anyway, uh, so we're going to talk about, first of all, uh, William, tell me your first, and you're this piano player for the group and people always watch your hands and, and what, what do you, what's your first memory of music? Uh, having a transistor radio this was back um probably late 60s and where uh, were you in danville virginia right uh, and this this transistor radio was shaped like a uh, it's like a red softball it had two dials one for tune one for volume and uh, I, I would listen to wdva and uh uh 12 country 50, 12 50. Yeah, homer, homer thomason uh, uh would, had a show called uh, uh, the Country Tea Birds out, out at the uh, Tea Bird, which was a club that he owned, and uh, they would broadcast uh, live every Saturday night. So that little transistor radio, um, and as well as listening to Clear, Creedence Clearwater Revival, and some of those uh, Cal Smith on the country station, uh, that's some of the earlier memories. Hey, uh, so I'll, since I'm from Danville, also V I L L E Vol for those of you that teach phonetics is my joke. Uh, I listened to WDB. I actually listened to BTM, which is more of the pop station. And, uh, and then that was the top 40 uh, secular station, except for the RJ Barber radio hour, <laughs> the Baptist Tabernacle. Mm -hmm. Anyway, uh, I listened to uh, DVA, both country music and DVA had, the, did they have the, uh, the, 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 the trading post on where you sold the stuff online? Uh, I mean, not online, right. but on the radio. Right, a swap shop or trading. Swap shop, yeah, yeah. Anyway, yeah, I got a Pontiac fo fo o, which is a Pontiac <laughs> 440. <laughs> anyway, so I remember that. And actually, when I was in high school, I actually was in a bluegrass band, and we played live on the radio. We we literally were around the mic. So JT, give us your Stanton first music memory. Uh, two things. First, listening to music was uh, I would. We had a console record player. I'm maybe three years old. And I liked the little records with the orange on the inside. And I didn't realize what that was. That meant it was Sun Records. Those are <laughs> my favorite ones. And so I'd find the orange ones, which would be Elvis and Rockabilly kind of stuff. And I'd reach over top into the console. We don't need a joke that I still have to reach over top into the console. But I would reach over top and put that in and scratch the needle across and find the beginning and play yeah. Elvis records. I will let you know that your head, your head is furthest from the top of the screen. I just, I just want to let you know that. Okay. Okay. All right. Yeah. Anyway. Then, okay. um, and I remember when mom and dad would go to the Moose Lodge for dances, uh, dad would go first and then mom would bring me for the first set. And I'm maybe five or six years old. And they would put me off the, to the side of the stage and listen to the band. And I'm just staring at the drummer the whole time. Listen to uh, Pete Martin and the versatile keys at the Stanton Moose Lodge. And they would take me and I would listen for a full set. And then mom would run me back home to the babysitter. And then she'd come back and hang with dad for the rest of the dance. Man, I tell you, that Jim Palmer could dance, couldn't he? Anyway, were they, were they good dancers? Excellent. Really, Excellent. really good. Yeah, cool. <laughs>
uh, JT, go ahead and talk about when you got in actually involved in, in taking music lessons, playing music, and you're a drummer, just to let the audience know. Uh, started in, in fourth grade, recorder, and then in fifth grade, started in band with Miss Sanger, Marguerite Sanger, and uh, that summer before fifth grade, Bob Sanger, her husband, who was the director at, uh, uh, or the music educator at Robert E. Lee High School, came and he taught us how to hold the drumsticks and got us started and everything with the basics. And then um, took, took lessons all the way, or took band all the way through through high school and then into um, all the way through college, four years of college. And I was a music minor in college and a business major. Yeah, were your, uh, were, were, what were some of the names of your bands outside of the school band in high school? <laughs> um, I think you know this, Rich. You're just suckering me here. Uh, it's uh, my Thank very you. first band was uh, this, this, this young kid named Daryl Jones. And his parents hired a few area musicians to come in and back him up. And at the first gig, we learned the name of the band was Daryl Jones and the Daryl Tones. Yeah! I tell you what, man. Where it all got started, thing. baby. Yeah, that's all started. And then you didn't you play with Denver? Denver played with Denver DeWitt in a in another little band called JDR Incorporated. It was my first real kid band. We were about 15 or 16. He played guitar. So it's JT Denver Randy, JDR Incorporated. And, and we, we did a few few little gigs. And Denver was Lou DeWitt's son, and Denver's still right. playing great guitarist. Anyway. Anyway, yeah. as was his dad. Okay, William. Tell me about your musical, uh, you know, piano, band, all that stuff. Well, well, well the first, first gig I had, I, I, I was, uh, well, I'll say gig, paying gig. I was 14 years old, and uh, uh, by happenstance, someone had heard me play, and they asked if I could go play, uh, uh, I believe it's a moose club. Um, it's somewhere up here in the valley, as a matter of fact. I forget whether it was uh, Lexington or Buena Vista or somewhere like that. Um, so uh, my parents agreed if my father could go along as well and so i didn't have a keyboard in those days there, there weren't many keyboards you, if you uh you either played a real piano or something that tried desperately tried to emulate a keyboard so there was no real really good <laughs> keyboards so i get to this moose club and um there's an upright piano but it had two padlocks on it one on each side <laughs> So, <laughs> you mean on the where the keyboards come up? Yeah, where the, the keyboard where the comes yeah, up and exposes off. the keys. Got gotcha. you. All right. Yeah. So um, they opened this upright piano for me to play. They pushed it up next to the stage, and and four hours of uh, rockabilly and uh, thrash and honky tonk music. I had about sixteen keys that didn't work when I finished the gig. So I took the key to the locks, laid them on the keys. I closed the lid. And lock the piano and <laughs> put the keys locked inside. <laughs> so, where did you, William? I mean, did you? When did you start playing the piano? How old were you? I, I was. Um, at, well, my parents um, purchased a, a piano from from his uh, from his family that had like a apple orchard, and they brought it home. And it, the intent was for my mother to 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 learn to play. Well, I, I'd heard the advertisement on TV of Fats Domino, you know, Candlelight Music proudly presents the legendary Fats Domino, then it would break right into Blueberry Hill. And so um, that, that really caught my ear, so I had to learn it. And so I just basically commandeered the piano and nobody else could play it after I decided. <laughs> and did you know the names of the notes on the piano or did you just play it? Uh, well, I, you know, with, with my family was a musical family, uh, so, I was familiar with the terms, and once I figured out, and I don't know who exactly uh, kind of taught me this, but once I figured out where C, D, E, F, I, I would sit down at that piano and I'd go through all the notes and uh, just work my way up and down the piano, naming off the notes uh, as I played them. Uh, so basically, it was a self taught um, uh, venture for me. And you kept kind of gigging solo in high school, and then you were right, right, the right. Um, Washington Eagle Band. <laughs> right, right. And uh, interestingly, I, uh, I didn't really blossom with with the talent until after the band years in school, when 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 I started operating around other peers that played music. Okay. And, and then that became this um, uh, 
exchange of idea, if you will. So your so your ears were picking it up. And, and oh yeah. Were you playing at the holiday? I mean, at the uh, the King of the Sea restaurant in Danville, Virginia? Boy, I hope I can find a picture of this to lay out. <laughs> Smitty. Yeah, I, I played the um, the waterfront room, and and uh, the person that played before me was a guy named Ernie Paul. He was a great um, uh, organ player. Played like a theater organ, dance organ. Anyway, when uh, Ernie Paul uh, uh, retired or, or quit playing at the waterfront room, uh, I started playing at the waterfront room uh, at the King of the Sea. And this was mainly during my college years at Danville Community College. So this would have been like the late eighties. Um, but the, the first steady gig probably would have been the Senior Citizen Center. The Granny Hop. Rising, yeah, the Granny Hop. Uh, <laughs> Which leads us to, to me. Yeah. Wait a minute, it's time for a commercial. Carry on down to Hardy's where they're offering the family style breakfast for $9 or the family style lunch for $15. And don't forget to donate money to the Wayne because that's a dollar's worth of tea right there. Why don't you give them about say a hundred dollars, fifteen dollars, whatever you got. So WayneTheater.org, talk to Tracy, tell her you want to give them some money to keep them guys like Chris Ray working while we're where, where we're hanging out. So they got they got big plans. What can you see? Yes, it's another spiritual <laughs> You take my nerves and you rattle my brain. Too much loving drives me insane. You burn my lips, that blood of tears. Goodness gracious, it's a Christmas tree for fire. Get it on, and I thought it was funny. Get it on, you lose your money. You take my mind, it's level fine. Goodness gracious, it's a Christmas tree for fire. Oh, my baby. And then my sister was taking lessons. We, I was sitting on the stoop and my sister got through lessons and she said, do you want to play? And I went, I don't know. So I went in and started playing. So I was in book two by the time my sister got past half of book one. So when it, we did the first recital, I played the teacher's part and she played coming around the mountain just like this. Anyway. And then in the uh, fifth grade, I took trumpet because of Tim Dishman, who I hope watches this. He's now living up in Parkersburg, West Virginia. Tim played the trumpet. And uh, he was a year older than I was. So I learned to play the trumpet. And then I kept playing all the way through elementary school, through high school. And then my brother got in a bluegrass band when I was in high school. And I started playing bluegrass. So I was kind of indoctrinated in the country world. And the, the real, you know, I was reading notes and playing with guys that, you know, said things like, what's that? You know, so, so, all right, JT. Yeah. So you're, we went to James Madison University together. I was known as the fat guy who played the banjo. Okay, all right. So according to JT, because uh, we did Foggy Mountain Breakdown as a drum solo, so I was sitting up with the drummers. So um, when you, what bands did you play with in college? Uh, I played with Whiskey Creek. I was one of the, yeah. one of the Mayor, original members of that group. Car Mayor Car Carolyn Dahl? That's right. Yeah, Mayor Stan Carolyn Dahl was a bass player and lead singer and general manager of the band. John That's Whitfield, right. her brother, yeah. Uh, we played, we were playing country rock right when Urban Cowboy had come out, like in the early 80s. 
Yeah. And uh, so that band paid for college for me, basically. And um, and so that, and then and then a couple little side bands, but for three and a half years through college, I played with Whiskey Creek and we played probably 50 weekends out of the year during that period. So it was, it was a perfect opportunity for me at the time. How did you make a gig? What were the hours? We played mainly nine to one. So we get there at 7.30, get back home at 2, 2.30. And I probably made a hundred and, a hundred bucks, 125 a gig. Pretty good. Oh, it was really good. Yeah, yeah. What about you, William? What, uh, during your college days, when you were playing solo piano, Granny Hop, the Senior Citizens Club, which was held at the old Stratford College, which I think is now owned by the hospital, maybe, and uh, and the old Stratford College, you know, another Presbyterian school. Now you you moved near another Presbyterian school, Mary Baldwin. So it was destiny, man. What can you say? Uh, I don't know. I would, uh, I guess, much like JT, uh, say somewhere between eighty and one hundred twenty-five bucks. If you could make make that a night, you were doing pretty good. Uh, yeah, this then. this is in the early eighties. Yeah, late seventies. Yeah, so that yeah, that's not too bad. Yeah, I, the first gig I got you, you made thirty-five bucks because I I had seen William. <laughs> I was, I was, I had graduated from James Madison University. I was moved to Stan. I'm the band director at Riverheads High School. And my brother says, Richard, why don't, R-I-C-H-A-R-D, Richard, why don't you come down and play with our band? We get this band called the Country Sounds. And uh, my dad, my mom had passed away. My dad was about four years after that and met a lady and he was good, who'd gone to Stratford College, by the way. And he was going to get married to her at the Presbyterian Church. And so I'm playing with my brother's band, playing horns. And during, and during break, I hear this, there's this guy over there at this upright piano with no locks on it and, uh, <laughs> and, and playing the piano. And it's, it's ragtime country, Dixielandish, New Orleans stuff. And I'm going, man, who's that dude? That's, that he be, you know. So I walked up to him and I said, uh, and he's like kind of a little pudgy guy. You know, I was a big pudgy guy. He was a little pudgy guy. And I was like, uh, so uh, yeah, can you play when the Saints go marching in? And he goes, he says, and I said, can you play it in like in key of F? You know, because I figured maybe no one song playing key. He goes, you mean F chord? I went, yeah. And he goes, he starts playing there. And so I offered him 35 bucks to, to, to come meet me in a month. And, you know, and I said, do you have a phone? He went, no. Nah. Damble, no. Translation, no. Nah. Uh, no. Nah. Anyway, and, and, and uh, do you have, a, you, you have a card now? I said, well, I'll pick you up in a month. And I'm thinking, this is never going to happen. And a month later, I drove by his house on the way home. And a month later, I came back and drove by his house, and he's sitting there with his little suit on. He's got his, I don't know what you had with you, but anyway, so I picked him up. We played the gig. Five minutes into the gig, my college roommate, who'd just gotten in the Air Force band, went, where did you find this guy, man? <laughs> so, that's, <laughs> so that's how we met. And then I brought him up to play with Janet Rose, who was a student I had that was a country singer. And, uh, and we had a little band that backed her up, JT's baby brother, Danny was in that band playing bass and Danny was like 14, Ken Fortune and all these it's young people and Missy and KB were the backup singers, a really good sound of band. And I still don't have a, we made a recording and I don't know where that cassette tape is. So, <laughs> so and, and then Enter 19 was at 84, JT, when did you graduate from college? 84. And I graduated in 81. So JT went on, I'm band director, Williams and Danville. When did you graduate from uh, high school, William? 84. 84. So, so JT, so here we go. It gives you the scenario of the numbers. I graduated from high school in 77. So I'm out, I'm the old guy and uh, JT goes away and plays on a cruise ship, right? You played at King's Dominion and on a cruise ship after you graduated from college. And then what happened? Started working a real job with, in the video business. Okay. And, and that's where, uh, and, but still played music all the time. Probably. Yeah, when did you meet William during the cruise ship? Did you meet him right at the end of that? I met William through you. Yeah. And day. I think you had just gotten off the ship. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, you 1985. You literally gotten off the ship and you met William. William was coming up staying with me on weekends. He ends up staying with your parents on the weekends because they had more room and food in their house. <laughs> <laughs> and probably toilet paper these days. <laughs> gravy and biscuits. <laughs> <laughs> gravy and biscuits. Yeah. Hey, can I get you some gravy and biscuits, said Jim. Anyway, uh, and, you know, they were kind of down home folks. They're really nice folks. Anyway, um, but I remember you, we met and JT says, well, why don't I book a couple gigs? I go, well, we've never played together. So that didn't make any difference. I, you know, so, so we, I walk around with JT, Mr. Salesman, here's, here's, here's the, here's the piece of paper, right? And, uh, 
here's a piece of paper and he would go, he would talk to somebody and talk about this band he had and, and then he would write a number on it and he would slide it across the table like this and go, and he would catch their eye. He'd look at their eye, this is how you do it, JT. This is how he started his own entrepreneur. He would follow their eye to the end of the piece of paper. He would look down at it and, and they'd look at it and he'd go, what do you think about that? And he booked three gigs that way, I saw him do it. It was amazing. He booked, a, uh, he booked um, McCormick's, the old McCormick's restaurant and bar, and which is now an assisted living place for people that are like 30. It's, it's kind of a yuppie, it's a yuppie apartment complex basically. <laughs> and, uh, and then he booked uh, the Holiday Inn on Sunday night and he booked a, a McDonough, Toyota, or all those guys at the country club. He booked, was it St. Patrick's Day maybe? Something like that? So it was right. McDonough, St. Patrick's, it worked pretty good. So we play the, we play the uh, Thursday night, we play what? McCormick's? Right. We go out to eat at Country Cooking. <laughs> we, first of all, we set up in the, in the in bar. We never played before. We, we'd never played together at all, okay? And we'd heard William play. I'd played with William. JT had never played with William. So, uh, and then about, and we go set up about six. We get set up. We're supposed to play at eight. We, we go into Country Cooking and we're the, just to let you know, the shrimp platter with all the fixing was four forty nine. Just want to let you know that. Okay, so we go to Country Cook, and, and then JT at, at about seven o'clock goes. So what do you guys want to play tonight? And uh, and and we start naming tunes, and then he gets out his pen and he writes on this list right here. I'll scan this so you can pay close. So all these tunes right here, all twelve of them. Okay, and uh, <laughs> uh, do y'all know the C Jam, uh, San Antonio Rose, Blueberry Hill Crazy? It's just sitting on the dock of the bay. Some of them we may have not played since. Last dates in there. Don't be cruel, Looney Tunes. Anyway, <laughs> so we played that night. The next, JT's mother, Sue, was the, what did she do at the library? A librarian. She was, oh, <laughs> so she ran the front desk. And she ran yeah. the front desk. And, and Sue, uh, Sue basically knew everybody. And so that day, the next day, she said, you gotta go see these kids play. And so Friday night, we weren't booked, but they booked us again and there was a line out. And people like Jim Harrington will tell you, that's the first time they ever, he was in that line. He said that's the first time he'd heard live music in Stanton was that night. And he said, you know, so it was cool. Anyway, so we meet then. And what was the name of the band that we did? We didn't have a name. It was called J.T. Falber and Friends. Oh, we play. I will say we played Saturday night for McDonough. And we were supposed to get like $100 or something like this for the band or $150 total. And we played and we played like basically two encores. We played and they said, could y'all play again if we passed the hat? They passed the hat and it had this money just piled up on it. And J.T. looked up and went, you guys want to do some more of this? Okay, you know, you'd be interested. And so that's kind of got, it was his motivation. He's a business guy. Uh, so what was the name of the band, JT, that we came upon? Somebody named us, what was it? Uh, Coulter Street was Cold a Club. main, Oh yeah. Coulter Street was a main drag in Stanton and a, and a popular band at that time was the Culture Club. So we called it the Coulter Club. Brilliant, man. Brilliant, absolutely brilliant. And somebody names, I think it was uh, Rick Miller who worked for the paper came up because people kept passing out. And we, we, we actually started asking for possibilities of the name. And his brother, Scott Miller, is a professional musician. And he, he's, he's moved back home. He's out of Nashville, mostly. Uh, okay, so we played, we gig, we played the little grill. It turns into eventually uh, uh, William's still gigging. He's living in Danville. JT's living in Richmond. I'm living in Stanton. We kind of changed jobs. Uh, we we're over, so this was 1984. So this was 30, how many years ago, JT? 30 something? About 34, 35. I think yeah. we started in 80, May of 85, right around there. Right, yeah, so 35 year. years, yeah. Uh, and sometimes we'd play, we'd go for a year and not play. And then uh, eventually the Wayne Theater opened up. And well, the Wayne Theater Alliance, which was the idea that they're gonna remodel the Wayne, Wayne Theater and we, became we did i think a concert there and they were doing things downtown at anywhere they could and we we became part of the uh, river city radio hour which claire myers started who now lives over in beautiful and scenic monterey virginia uh and claire is a retired dean at elon and he's a theater guy but he's and really good at that and a really good administrator and uh and so they it was a retro radio show kind of a garrison keeler kind of thing and uh and we had little shirts and all that kind of stuff and uh and, and can you remember some of the places we played, e either one of you? A couple of churches. Yeah, Main Street Methodist. Uh, we played the, the old Radio Shack building in uh, Willow Oak Plaza. 
for a while. They had some egg cartons hanging up there or something like that. We played downtown at what was soon to be called the, uh, the Gateway. Gateway. Yeah. And they had that room before, but then a little few people bought that, uh, I think on the board and bought that building or rented that building, leased it to make the Gateway. And uh, so we, were the, we ended up being the house band for that. And uh, in the meantime, who else you playing with, JT, during that period of time, just starting back in the 80s? Oh, gosh. The, a lot of community bands out of, uh, out of Richmond at the time, you know, the, the Richmond community band, um, a couple of wind ensembles. I always played, I generally played drums in bigger churches with the orchestras. And so all the way through from Richmond to, to living in Roanoke and now in Salem, it's been area community bands, swing bands, uh, just a lot of stuff, really. And you play musicals for the, for the uh, Roanoke? Mill Mountain Theater. Yeah, yeah you're kind of the head. It's head a regional guy. professional theater, and, and we do about three to five shows a year there. Okay. And William, uh, so what about you? Who else do you play with from 84? And we're getting ready to run out of time here, so. Okay. Uh, I started playing at a, a club called Carolina Country, and this, uh, this wasn't a – you didn't have putting greens with this club. Um, it was the old rough and high schools where my mother went to school. Yeah. Right. They so had it was both, a country, kind of, both kinds of music, country and like, Western. Right? <laughs> country and Western. Um, so I played from 87 till um, uh, New Year's Eve, 2002. So um, uh, January 1, 2003, I, 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 that was my last night at Carolina Country Club. And that was uh, the majority of my music playing through that 16 or 17 year period. Um, what about the tight squeeze Philharmonic? Oh yeah, yeah, I did do tight squeeze <laughs> Philharmonic, and that that was uh, they they would perform these Tin Pan Alley, Dixieland type songs, uh, and I played stride piano, so that was a nice little gig for me. You were the baby in that group, right? By, right, by right. 40, I, was, 30 I, was, years. I was about forty-five years younger than the mean age. <laughs> <laughs> and now people can say that about us. That's great, man. Right. <laughs> anyway. All right, well, we're probably gonna, uh, so eventually it turned into Live at the Wayne and we ended up at the Wayne Theater. Uh, and so this is the history of the Boogie Kings and uh, I'm gonna, uh, uh, you know, it, put music in between this. I'm gonna put tunes we actually played live. Anyway, uh, JT, you gonna keep playing? How long are you gonna play? Oh man, I don't know. I'm 58 now, at least 30 years more. I would guess. Yeah, yeah. And your kids are playing. Your son just got the drum major gig at uh, James Madison. Congratulations, Kyle. He's playing yeah. leading the jazz ensemble. Your daughter just recorded a brass quartet that made me sound horrible. And uh, and, and William, <laughs> William is, a, is a master of the accordion. Why don't, you, why don't we close this out with a little bit of a squeeze box there, William? <laughs> Try not to cry, JT. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, here we go. Here we go. Yeah. Eight old boys. Don't forget, donate money to the Wayne Theater. Go ahead. Donate money to the Wayne Theater. Take it away. It's been co sponsored by Hardy. WayneTheater.org. Please give money there. The Booker King will be back. All right. Thank you, guys. I'm going to end this meeting.